national baseball reporter for the Washington Post. Chelsea, great to have you on. Too bad nothing's happening for this, you know, lower level team right now in the division. What adjective would you use to describe the past week for the Washington Nationals? Huh. Adventurous, I would say, <laughs> I think, is a polite one. It's been <laughs> an absolutely wild week of conjuring chaos out of what was otherwise looking pretty functional. Yeah, and it was a nice rebuild, too. We gave them props throughout the year. They've played well. They've been coached well. The rebuild has, has gone maybe quicker than some of the other ones, like we talked about Baltimore plenty. So whew. let's start with Steven Strasburg, since that's nice and fresh, and we've gotten some context behind the scenes, too. What's your take on how they've handled and really botched this? And correct me if I'm wrong on that front, because you know the information that I got was they spoke – with Boris during that Dylan Cruz press conference and said, hey, let's work this out. Because also for them, he's taking up a roster spot in the offseason. So there is a benefit to getting him off of the roster and having him retire. Coming back to him like 48 hours to go when he's bringing family and friends in town and saying, just kidding, we want money back. That sounds pretty shitty. Yeah, it's it's still unclear to me and, and my colleagues, Jesse Doherty and Barrys Faluga, who also reported on this, you know, exactly what the hang up is. If it's really money, you know, it seems like that is sort of silly because we all sort of know the union is not going to let them not pay out that deal. Scott Boris is not going to let them pay out that deal. So, I, you know, I, I think it might be as simple as they want him to do more appearances and, or, you know, it's, it's hard to tell exactly why there is a holdup. But the fact that there is one is is just completely unnecessary. I mean, it's it's very clear to everyone in that organization that he can't pitch again, you know, that he's going to have trouble doing many normal things again with that arm. So, you know, they're just dragging out a process that doesn't need to be dragged out. And like you said, they need the spot. So it's in their best interest to kind of get this done and, and have it be quick and clean. And for some reason, you know, the ownership group just could not get out of their way and say, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll let you go on your terms, whatever, we'll pay you the contract and be done. You know, there had to be a hang up and it's still sort of unclear to me and many others exactly what that was. Yeah, and it's kind of unclear to me as well. Looking back and reading the things, it's it's 100 percent that he's got this injury that he can't really come back on. So it's isn't it written in your contract? You know, we talk about the Prince Fielder thing as well. Like I understand, you know, Prince got his money down the road. But isn't there something that says, listen, if you can't play because you're injured, like that's in your contract. Now, why, why is it such a big holdup? It's so confusing. I know. And, and again, I don't think it's the money because there's kind of no world in which they're not going to pay that whole contract. And I don't think there's anyone in the organization who thinks they're getting out of it. I think there's something else behind the scenes there, whether, you know, we've heard people speculate that Major League Baseball was worried about this. I've heard from Major League Baseball, as you would expect, saying, no, no, we have nothing to do with this. But you know, that doesn't mean there aren't conversations had with, with the owners. But, you know, I think on some level, it's it's just, you know, the Nationals want something for what they're paying him. I don't know what that looks like, but, you know, it's not going to be anything on the field. So whatever they're waiting for, um, it's not going to get any easier for them to get it now that they've kind of embarrassed him publicly and got Scott Boris mad. It's it's all just kind of petty. And, and I think from what we've heard, just completely unnecessary on the part of the learners. I know that they decided it's a two-way street to pay him after they had won that World Series. He, he did bring them something. He brought them a lot of tickets and fanfare over the years and a World Series title where he was World Series MVP. Yes, super disappointing since then, but it's mostly related to physical ailments. So the layer that got me going was we talked about this on Friday on our show, and then after the show, the Nats come out with that statement like, blah, 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 let's keep this private, whatever. Quote, it is our hope that ongoing conversations remain private and you're smiling out of respect for the individuals involved until then we look forward to seeing steven when we report to spring training now the petty meter is off the charts we broke the petty meter because we're going to make the dude that is physically cleared by doctors that he cannot pitch again and he if he even tried to do something anymore it's i've gotten this too from people like he could really damage usage of his arm long term so that's done so did you just say hey, show up to spring training and sit there because you're under contract. Ha ha. It's wild. I mean, that sentence, up until that sentence, I was like, okay, okay, I'm with the, oh my gosh. You know, like, <laughs> I can't tell you what, how many text messages came in right after that from people in and around the organization just being like, oh no, what, where did that come from? You know, um, I think it's fairly safe to say that is something 
that a PR person would have and probably did ward against and then and then was sort of overruled by the bosses there. But yeah, that's pure pettiness. That's pure, hey, Scott Boris, you can say whatever you want. You can call as many reporters as you want, but this guy's under contract and, and we're going to act like it. And he's going to have to keep up with that. So yeah, that was just unnecessary. I, I don't, I think they will probably regret adding that statement, but that was one of the most, uh, it was a very Nazi thing to do, but also somehow shocking at the same time. So absolutely wild. Yeah, and I read Barry Sverluga's article, um, your colleague, saying Nat's going to Nat. It's a very popular <laughs> phrase out there. Because, again, like we started this conversation saying, this team's won a World Series. They've had star power. Yes, they've let some of their superstars go. They're already rebuilding quite well. So credit to Mike Rizzo and the group for putting that together because many teams have rebuilt very poorly over the years. Um, what's the context of why the Nats Nat? Like I read a little bit into what Barry said where there's like bickering with the families and the owners. So they just seem to do these little petty things to, you know, negotiate contracts with someone like Mike Rizzo, or I know that they've tried to kind of underpay managers slash coaches in the past. Like they seem to have these things that most of the rest of baseball does that they just can't get over doing. Yes. And I think a lot of that has to do with the learner family. You know, you don't make a ton of money and make billions of dollars by not being kind of, I guess, careful with money, but, but they sort of take it to a, another level. Um, you know, Ted Lerner, who was the, in charge for a long time, you just didn't want to lose a deal, you know, whether that was negotiating with Dusty Baker or another team or a Scott Boris, you know, he just didn't want to give more than he had to give. And, you know, his son, Mark, is now in charge. And the way that it's worked is, you know, Mark and a couple of other, you know, family members of that generation make every decision via vote from what I understand. So that means there are a lot of opinions. Um, there's not a lot of consensus always. And even when there is, you know, somebody is worried about something that the others aren't and it holds everything up, which I think is is partially why you haven't seen, you know, the team get sold yet. But yeah, there's, there's just always been this feeling that they're not gonna pay anyone any more than they absolutely have to. Um, probably smart in real estate, but has rubbed a lot of people the wrong way in baseball over the years. and. I think it doesn't help that we're talking about Steven Strasburg, who's the one guy they did pay out for, and that didn't work out. So there's just kind of a lot of tension around all of it, and um, that's that's the Nats natting in, at their best. <laughs> was the was the retiring the jersey thing? Did I read that right? Were they going to retire his jersey? Was and if that's true, is was that a reach? To me, is that a reach? Like retiring his jersey before you retire Zimmerman's if you're actually retiring Strasburg's? So they weren't going to do it like this weekend. That wasn't part of the plan yet. It was sort of tentatively on the plan for next year at some point where they'd have like a big on field ceremony. This was just going to be like a quick press conference. Like I can't do this anymore. Goodbye. Um, it's, I don't, I think they still will. I don't think this is going to ruin that. Um, and I, I, I can see why it seems like a stretch sort of from the outside, but I will say to people in that organization and, and fans in particular, like his arrival and his debut was, the moment where you know the, the expansion or whatever new washington nationals sort of started looking like a a credible team for the first time like that guy coming in it was like oh you can we can have some really good talent here um so you know he was a turning point and and frankly he got them that world series so whatever anyone thinks about his career you know that's that's all that's the biggest moment in Nats history and he was right at the center of it and i think he's he's somebody that will kind of be remembered bigger here than he ever will anywhere else in the last five years, the Nationals had some big stars. You know, we think about Bryce Harper, Strasburg, Soto, Turner. Um, <clears throat> have you ever seen any team have something like this and not have any of these guys ever on the team anymore? It's crazy. You know, I, I switched from covering the Nationals to covering sort of national baseball in general, and I just went and found all the former Nationals, and they were at the heart of everything happening in baseball everywhere else. I mean, Bryce Harper, Trey Turner, Max Scherzer, it's crazy. Um, but no, you know, and I think that's part of, um, you know, it's, it's individually, they all kind of left under circumstances that were semi understandable. I mean, they let Anthony Rendon go and I think everyone would say that was a good idea. Um, you know, I don't know if they were gonna be able to pay Trey Turner and Juan Soto, so they felt like they had to choose. You can argue about whether that's true, but when you sort of step back and look in the aggregate, there's, there's two things that are interesting. Number one, I mean, those are some of the best players in baseball and they somehow let them all go. They didn't retain any of them. 
Um, and then also like all those guys remember their Nats time surprisingly fondly. Um, I think, you know, you might remember when, when Max Scherzer got traded to LA, Juan Soto and, um, and Turner was in LA too. Like Juan Soto went to the wild card game to cheer them on. You know, it's like, they're, they're all, they remember that time fondly, but it doesn't look from the outside, like an organization that people want to stick around in. So it's just kind of really interesting, but, uh, yeah, it's it's really I think depressing for people in DC, particularly to like look up the road in Philly and see former Nat Kyle Schwarber, former Nat Trey Turner, former Nat Bryce Harper, hitting coach Kevin Long. I mean, it's just like, you know, hundred hundred percent contending to zero in in a couple of years, just a total exodus. You've covered uh, the Nationals as we know, and you've covered the 2020 presidential uh, election too as well. So. My question to you is how crazy was it in 2020 and what do you like better doing? You know, it was absolute chaos in 2020. Um, and I'm very happy to be covering baseball again. Uh, <laughs> politics was, you know, the stakes were high, but, but this is a world that makes a lot more sense. Um, you know, people actually answer questions in this world sometimes, which, which doesn't happen in politics. So yeah, it's, I like baseball a lot better, but that was a, a really cool experience that has made me appreciate baseball even more, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Being on the scene down there, I remember when the Nats were in their peak, right. And they're making playoff appearances and then winning in 19, when I was covering the team, um, the talk about the area was, there's all these fans that are close enough to Baltimore and DC and they're all, they're all Nats fans now. Do you feel like that's shifting now during this time period? I hate rebuilds. Like when you have to scrap it all down and restart and you don't spend for a while and all of that. So do you feel like that could shift because for a, the Orioles tanked for a while. And the one concerning thing, even we just had Adam Frazier on and he said like, they saw the John Angelos quotes. They're not going to resign any of their dudes. That's how it's being perceived. there. like, enjoy the ride for a few years. So like, what is the state of baseball for young fans in that area? It's a great question. You know, I think the Nats were really lucky that they not only got good, but they got good at a time when the Orioles were, you know, mostly down, um, the, the Washington football team was pretty irrelevant. That's sort of the gem of DC sports fandom, um, but hasn't been because they've been so irrelevant. And now, you know, the Nats kind of drop off the face of the earth, right? When the football team is coming back and right as the Orioles look like they're ready to, to really make some noise. So it's going to be interesting. You know, we used to cover the Orioles full time. We don't anymore, but I think we'll probably, you know, have to do some more than we normally have just because there's a lot of interest. Like there's a lot of former Orioles fans you know, in Washington, D.C., who had the Nats to distract them, but probably have some loyalty left. So I'll be really interested to see sort of how the playoffs go, you know, how how much D.C. sort of gets behind the Orioles or it doesn't. Um, you know, there's there's plenty now of Nats, Nats fans, people that grew up Nats fans, people that wouldn't even think about the Orioles. But there's there's a little bit lingering there and there's always sort of tension between those two teams, too, which makes it interesting. So it'll be interesting to see what what kind of, you know, turnout DC gives to the Orioles um, as they sort of make a run here. And, and that is true. You know, when you try and like rank Chelsea, what's going on there from an ownership perspective, um, Daniel Snyder's got to take the cake, like for being the, the shitty owner out there. Right. And then like John Angelos probably takes number two on the power rankings ahead of, you know, the learners, they make mistakes, but the, to me, there's still a separation there uh, with those three. I mean, that that's a tough group right there in that area. When you come to think of it, the, the, the Washington football team alone and what they've gone through over the past like 10 years makes almost anything else in sports seem not that bad. Totally. Um, you know, I saw some people tweeting yesterday when the football team looked very functional with their new owner. You know, I guess we don't get to have two normal sports teams at the same time because the Nationals are doing whatever they're doing right now and, and not looking super functional. But yeah, it's it's interesting. I think I think you're right that the learners, maybe they get a bad rep um, for, for some of the things we talked about earlier. But at the same time, I mean, there were there were years in there where they had a top five payroll. You know, they won the World Series. You know, they brought in Max Scherzer. It's not like they did nothing. Um, but Angelos is interesting. You know, I'm actually at Camden Yards right now and uh, you know, those comments he made about about maybe not paying guys down the line. It's just like sort of you get in your own way. You know, you don't even need to say that right now, really. So you could pretend and, and fake it. Um, but, you know, my favorite part of that dynamic and, you know, is is that the teams sort of hate each other, too. You know, those two ownership groups do not like each other because of the dispute over their TV rights and 
um, you know, when when Ted Lerner, the patriarch of of the you know Nationals family, died, um, you know, the the Orioles issued a statement that was basically like Ted Lerner was a businessman and condolences to his family. And it was sort of the most generic, uh, least heartfelt thing I had seen um, about that. And it was just funny. It's just like absolutely classic for these guys. They sort of coexist, but um, there's zero love lost and they are always in competition. And I guarantee you that the Orioles will know exactly how many more fans they drew to their playoff games than the Nats <laughs> or whatever. Um, it's, you know, I'm sure it's annoying for them, but it's kind of fun to watch. Oof, they're so mature. Gotta love it. Okay, so, so <laughs> lastly... Yeah, let's finish with this, just to circle back to Rizzo for a moment, because I, I respect what he's done. Do you think there's any chance that Mike Rizzo says, you know what, enough. Like, I've made enough money. I don't need to take this shit. I'm saying, and the reason I bring this up is, what if, and I don't know how the offseason's going to look, something else opens up, and an owner calls him and says, hey, dude, I like what you've been doing, and I need help. Like, we can see from the Mets situation, finally, it sounds like they'll get their guy in David Stearns. It's not like there's tons of executives out. There might be tons of talented executives, but there aren't many that other ownership groups fall in love with because you hear the same names over and over again. So I'm just wondering, you know, Mike Rizzo, I know some people brought up his name with the White Sox situation, but I, it sounded like maybe that was more of a leverage play because they were never going to go outside the org. But other teams could, you know, it's possible. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely got more of an old school reputation, um, which is, I think, why, you know, the White Sox sort of made sense, just because we kind of know they were kind of an old school organization, um, for better or worse. So I, you know, I don't know what the market would be for him. But I think if you look at what they've done, you would think that there would certainly be interest. That being said, you know, he he's kind of put down roots in DC. He's, he's got his house kind of within walking distance of the park and had the World Series trophy in the window for people to see, you know, in the years after that. So I think he really likes DC. I think he um, is sort of aware that he um, he's one of the few people that frankly has been able to manage up in, with the learners. They're, they're difficult to work with and he's managed to kind of create winning um, despite some of their idiosyncrasies. I think he knows what he's got here and he's, you know, they've made a lot of changes in the last week and probably more to come on the scouting side. Um, you know, they're trimming down, but I think potentially with an eye on, on building up in, in more modern ways, which is what I think they need to do. So it certainly seems like he's making some tough decisions now for a, a future that he, you know, is in charge of, but you know, they, they put him through this almost every time he's got a deal. There's always like, when will he sign? Why are they dragging this out? So I think he's used to it. And frankly, you know, in some ways, I think, you know, this is the team he wants to be a part of, you know, flaws and all, and, and he's handled it pretty well to this point. Yeah, no, I mean, he hasn't gone out and, and said anything, so I give him credit on that front, because he actually, I like him on an interview, usually he's pretty, you know, outspoken and will give you stuff, which I appreciate, as some GMs don't, um, so, uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. Chelsea, great to have you on here for the first time, we appreciate it, hope you had fun, and enjoy the night at Camden. Thanks for having me.